Klam. This is Conversations with Poets, once again in the Rare Books Room, the Hervey Rare Books Room, or right next to the California Room, and California Poet Laureate Lee Herrick is here. Hi, Lee. Hi. Thanks Hi. for having me, Michael. All right, welcome. And you've been to San Diego before, I take it, or is this your first time down? Or? I've been here a few times. Yeah. It's beautiful every time. Yeah. yeah. You are first and foremost and forever the Poet Laureate of Fresno, right? <laughs> and then California Poet Laureate. Uh, what was it like for you when you got the call? Yeah, thrilling, surprising, um, humbling. I mean, it's not anything that most poets think of. I, I never thought about it. Um, but I was nominated, and when I knew that my nomination had moved on to the governor's office, then it started to feel a little bit more possible Right. But when I got the call, it, it was thrilling. It, it's, it's pretty exciting. Once it gets to the governor's office, too, it's down to three poets. Is that right? I think so. Yeah, yeah. so Gavin, Gavin, in the end, chose you as Poet Laureate? Um, yeah, you know, I think there's a group of poets mm -hmm. and educators and writers who do the initial screening and um, forwarding on the finalists. Mm -hmm. And I believe there are three. Mm -hmm. um, and I eventually interviewed with about six or seven people from the governor's staff. And that was a pretty interesting and wide-ranging interview. And yeah, ultimately the appointment sits with Governor Newsom. Was it a Zoom interview or did you sit down in a room with a group of people? The, it was on Zoom. Yeah. yeah, it was on Zoom. And there were a couple of people from the first partner's staff. Right. Um, she's very invested and passionate and um, pretty um, real advocate for the arts. Yeah. And so it was a couple of her staff and some people from different areas of, of the administration. Right. No, you weren't born in California. You work, live, teach in Fresno. Mm -hmm. uh, but you were born in South Korea, correct? Right. Then right. adopted and came to California at 10 months? Right, oh. right, right. So I was born sometime in late 1970. Mm -hmm. And I don't know exactly when but um, my paperwork says December 1970. Mm -hmm. And I was with the Holt Adoption Agency, and I believed I lived in someone's home for a while with a, a foster family. And I was adopted by a white um, Caucasian American couple who were living in the Bay Area. And so I arrived in California in 1971 mm -hmm. at San Francisco. International Airport, and um, my Korean name at the time was Lee Kwang Su, and I became Lee Herrick. Lee Herrick. Yeah. Well, they did a fine job, your new family, oh. yeah? Oh. Yeah, they got you <laughs> here, you. you were supported all the way through, and uh, uh, so did you start writing poetry at a very young age? It, I get a sense that it happened a little later on for you. Could you yeah. write as a teenager about what it was like to be adopted and living yeah. with a white family in California? That's a great question. So, you know, my mom is an artist, a visual artist, and I think when you're growing up around someone like that who's constantly write, uh, painting and thinking about color and nuance and um, talking about framing and things like that, it just, for me, it made its way into my way of thinking and seeing the world through the arts. Um, it was very difficult to write about adoption early on. Yeah. Uh, I was, however, writing a lot of rap lyrics in high school, and I was listening to um, classic rock and Led Zeppelin and, and later punk. And so I was writing song lyrics, yeah. but writing about adoption and difficult things like that came a little bit later mm -hmm. for me. Yeah. Kind of makes sense, right? Yeah. So what was it? It was uh, Public Enemy. Mm. Right, Black Flag, <laughs> yes, as, uh, yes. Or, and then you went hip hop a little bit because I saw you also um, uh, founded Lit Hop. Yeah, so you've either done your homework or you <laughs> listened to those groups too. We just interviewed uh, Jason Magabo Perez and his whole, all the sounds and his whole trajectory oh. started with, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, um, loved Public Enemy. Uh, that first album came out and then their second album, It Takes a Nation of Billions to Hold Us Back. Um, and, and a little bit of Black Flag, but between rap and punk in the mid-80s, there was so much 
visceral energy mm -hmm. and anger and um, voice that came out of that time that really spoke to me. Yeah. Um, it, it really came at the perfect time for me. Like I think a lot of music and a lot of poetry will. It'll come to the person when they're ready. Yeah. And so that was pretty important for me, yeah. that, that early music. How about the Led Zeppelin and the Jimi Hendrix that you mentioned before? Is that in there too? Yeah, my first book, I wrote a poem called, I think it's called Listening to Janis Joplin. Mm -hmm. um, Jimi Hendrix, Led Zeppelin, probably my favorite group is Led Zeppelin. Yeah. Um, just the expansive imagination mm -hmm. on the guitar of Jimmy Page and um, Bonham's drumming, which is magical and visceral mm -hmm. and, and charged. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a poetry of its own. So your poetry has kind of had it had its roots in that you were listening to this music, those voices, they were angry. Uh, and then you started to write more as you've gotten older, maybe more reflectively and yeah. looking back at your life. Uh, has the sound and tone and the way that you present those poems, has that also changed? Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, interesting. it's interesting because I don't think my early poems on the surface felt angry or seemed angry, but I think when we're writing about an emotion that's initially rooted in some anger or trauma or struggle, which in my case was adoption. Mm -hmm. For me, it was more of a way of just making sense of it and trying to, um, quite frankly, trying to survive some of those doubts. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I think with any poet, the writing is going to change from book to book or even poem to poem, like our lives are going to change. Um, but uh, I do think there's a place for those emotions in my poems still. Yeah. yeah. Do you go back to the old journals? Do you look at old work and fix it up, or are you always moving forward? I do occasionally, but, but not very often. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to move forward mostly. Um, I know that there are a few ideas, though, in the journal that I'd like to revisit. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite poets, I saw at a reading once, and she was about 60, and she said uh, that 20 years ago, she, she said to herself she would never write another angry Latina poem huh. or identity poem. But she, and then she joked that she just wrote one, you know. So I, I think those really? things always stay with us. They just change, yeah. um, and that's okay. No, uh, I saw that you had an experience at a gas station, and this was kind of a moment for you. Mm. Uh, you were at the gas station, this woman insulted you. Mm. And that's when you found your voice, because instead of just sucking it up and eating it, yeah. you confronted her. Yes. Um, yeah, that's some... Nice homework. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I was about 20, 21 at the time, 21 or 22 years old. And I was living in Turlock, a small town in Central California. And I had pulled up to this other car, and a woman mouthed the words to me, um, Goddamn Jab. And it was one of the first times, or if not the first time, I remember that kind of racism being so blatantly said directly to me when I heard it. And I can still remember being physically changed. I remember my body getting hot, and I did say something to her, and I said it in a way that it took over me. And I think that's when a poem and when the poetry is happening best or when our lives are being lived most fully is when something happens almost beyond our control. Mm. So for example, if you're in an art gallery or a beautiful library or at a concert and the music or the book 
or the painting just stops you and changes you. That's what happened at the gas station that day. Mm -hmm. And so it was very formative for me and it was one of the first times I ever really spoke out because you know, I was raised to not make waves and maybe the person was in a bad mood. Um, but now I recognize a few things. One is mood has nothing to do with it and that keeping it in, that compresses on the person. It compressed down on me too much and we have to be able to voice those things, whether it's in the moment or through our poems or in any creative way. When you teach, when you mentor, is this the message that you give to young writers or uh, budding writers to express themselves in this way? Be brave enough to stand I, up I and do. speak your voice? I do, and it's, it's partly about bravery, but it's really, I think, about each poet on his or her or their own terms, whatever it might be. But I do try to encourage young writers to do it as fully as they can, mm -hmm. to be able to not only tap into it, but also to work through it in a poem so that the emotions and the experiences are fully there. But it's, it's difficult and it's a process, mm -hmm. but um, ultimately it's rewarding. And that's, for me, what it's about is, is the rewards, which can be liberating. Yeah. You know? Do you believe or do you have a discipline? Do you have a process for your own writing that you share with your students so that they can kind of be committed to the craft? I think reading widely and regularly is important. I think, yeah, I, I mean, we're in a gorgeous mm -hmm. library here. This is the Rare Books Room, right? Yeah. At the San Diego Central Library. And so I think if you're surrounding yourself with any kind of reading, it's gonna help the writing process. Any kind of exploration, I think, is important. Mm -hmm. um, travel, food, music. Um, and just having faith and, and belief in themselves and being true to themselves. Yeah. You, know. you write quite a bit about food. Yeah, agriculture makes sense, Fresno, yeah. 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 Um, I went to high school in Napa Valley. Mm. My uh, school was Vintage High School. Mm. Our mascot was the Crusher in wow. a vat of grapes, and our colors were burgundy and gold, <laughs> red and white wine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, did you, um, does most of your writing, are you a foodie? Does mm. that sort of your earthiness in your work, does that come from being in the middle of California? I think it might. Um, I wouldn't call myself a foodie in terms of, of really knowing all the nuances that go into a dish. Um, and that might be the Fresno in me too. Yeah. Um, I don't think Fresno is going to have the Michelin starred restaurants and, and all of that as much as some other cities. Yeah. But what we do have is farmers markets every day of the week. Um, farms and you know farmers markets that are producing um, I've heard something like 60 or 70 percent of the fruits and vegetables around the country. So that Central Valley has influenced me a lot. Mm -hmm. Just the sweat, the work of it, mm -hmm. the simplicity of it. Um, but food, I mean, that's a natural yeah. relationship with poetry, I think. It's I'm its own kind of art. Food. Yeah, no yeah. doubt. Yeah. Um, I read My California to a group of students. And there's a line in there about 24-hour uh, farmer's markets, like mm. all the time being able to go get food. Yeah. And they love that part of the poem. And uh, one of the things that they said was that would, we would be together all the time. We'd always <laughs> be out there. There'd be busking and music, not just the food, but yeah. the sounds and the people and coming together. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that line was part of the poem where I started to imagine a bit more of California that I would like to see. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the homeless eating well, no internment in the valley, 24-hour farmer's markets, and things like that. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that's one of the things poetry can do, mm -hmm. is let us imagine or let readers envision what they think is possible. But um, absolutely, I would, I would love a 24-hour farmer's yeah. market where you could just go up and eat. Yeah, and then uh, Chinatown everywhere, mm -hmm. right? Armenia yeah. Town everywhere. Yeah. Little Italy everywhere. Yeah. I actually thought you were going to stay in Little Italy when you came down. Yeah, you know, I love 
any city I go to, I, I'm wanting to try the food and also see where different immigrant groups are living and what the neighborhoods are like. Mm -hmm. um, when, when my wife and I travel and my daughter, we always make a point to try to find the Chinatown or the J-Town, K-Towns, -town, K mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Uh, so when you got the Poet Laureate Post, right, there's a process, you're nominated. Was it the same thing in Fresno? In Fresno, did someone say, hey, Lee Herrick's the guy, we gotta get him in here, mm. and then you had a committee experience? If somebody wants to be Poet Laureate of California, you have to have someone on your side, right? Yeah, f the Fresno Poet Laureate ship was very different, um, but thank goodness there is a Poet Laureate position in Fresno. It was started mm -hmm. maybe 10 years ago, yeah. and that one's a bit more streamlined. You know, you're, you're nominated and, and there's um, a process. I wasn't interviewed, and then you're appointed. No interview. No interview, no. Um, and um, the, the city council, uh, and the mayor, I think, is the one ultimately out of the mayor's office who appoints. Right. And it was a two-year term. Um, the California Poet Laureate ship is a much different process. Um, it's much more official. Um, I'm actually going through a Senate confirmation now. Huh. So it's, it's a public appointed position out of the governor's office. And as I was reminded, it's the fourth largest economy in the world mm -hmm. by country. Um, about 40 million people, 10 million more than the next most populous state, Texas. And so that process felt very different. Yeah. Um, and the Senate confirmation is supposed to wrap up in the next few weeks. Sure. Um, if a person wanted to, um, and I'm, I'm so excited to, to be reading with the San Diego Poet Laureate tonight. Yeah, Jason. Uh, Jason's great. And mm -hmm. so, you know, if a person wanted to, um, if they were interested in the California Poet Laureate position, I would encourage, encourage them to visit the California Arts Council mm -hmm. website. And there's a, a process there, because yeah. um, there are so many great poets in the state. True, yeah. true. Uh, do you uh, feel a connection to Fresno uh, that is everything in the sense of you live there, you teach there, your family's there, but you yeah. also feel like uh, I represent California, this massive state yeah. for us and yeah. our place in the nation yeah. in yeah. literature. Yeah. And so you're a historical figure, right? Mm. Is that, does it feel that way? Does it feel like you're part of the history of our Gosh. That's a good question. literary times? It's a good question, Michael. I, one historical aspect of it that, that does feel meaningful is that I'm the first Asian American California Poet Laureate. Mm -hmm. That's, that feels special to me. And, and not that I'm special, but when I'm out on the road and I'm doing events, you know, people will come up to me and, and say what that means to them. Yeah. And that feels very good. Um, I, I think there probably could have been one before me, and I'm hoping there will be one after me, For sure. and several after me. Um, I feel mostly like a poet, and I, and I want to do the best work I can in service of poetry and honoring the position and the incredible poets and readers and young people and seniors and librarians everywhere I can in California. Yeah. It, I, I take it seriously. I don't take myself too seriously, but I know the position is meaningful, mm -hmm. and I'm thrilled to be in this position for a couple of years. Who was before you? Dana Gioia, right? Yes. And then Juan Felipe Herrera, yes. right? Yes. Uh, there was a three-year gap between Dana mm -hmm. and you getting the post. Correct. Uh, was that because of COVID? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know why. It, it might have been uh, related to the previous administration, what was going on. Mm -hmm. um, it it might have been COVID-related. Um, but yeah, about a three-year vacancy. And I know that there were a lot of poets throughout the state who tried to get the position going again. Mm -hmm. And the California Arts Council is pivotal in this position. Uh, the Arts Council does incredible work and has been doing incredible work making this position happen and all of the events surrounding the laureateship. 
but yeah, it was Juan Felipe and then Dana, and Al Young, I think, was in there before mm -hmm. before them. Um, so yeah, it's it's a pretty uh, humbling thing to be mentioned alongside them. And those names, right? Yeah. Uh, mentors too, yeah? Oh yeah, uh, oh yeah. Do you have a local mentor? We got a show tonight based on the Steve Cowett yeah. Poetry Prize. Uh, yeah. He's one of my mentors for sure, and someone we yeah. all looked up to. Yeah. And he did a little bit of everything. You know, you could be inspired just open in one of his collections. Yeah. But he did a lot of teaching as well. Yeah. Um, uh, did you bring a poem today to share? And would you, would you like to read a sure. mentor poem first, or a Callot poem, or one of your own? I'd be honored to. You know, and I, I wanted to say how excited I am to be reading at this event tonight, mm -hmm. and that there's the prize in his name. Um, I never was able to meet him, but of course I knew of his work, yeah. um, knew of his teaching, and knew of his sort of iconic um, teaching anthology. Yeah, in the palm uh, of your in hand. the palm of your hand, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I've got many mentors. One in Fresno, you mentioned Juan Felipe has been instrumental. Um, I'd like to say there's something together in their spirits, Yeah, you know? Yeah. But um, one thing I admired about Coet was his levity and his humanity and his grace. And so I th thought I would read his poem that is titled, Last Will. If I am ever unlucky enough to die, God forbid, I would like to be propped up in my orange overstuffed chair with my legs crossed dressed in a cashmere sweater and jeans, and embalmed in a permanent glaze, like a donut or linen, a small bronze plaque on the door of my study, showing the dates of my incarnation and death, and leave the room as it was. Let nothing be touched in the house. My underpants stuck on the doorknob just where I left them my dental floss lying on top of the Bhagavad Gita next to my socks. Let the whole of Eber's street be roped off and planted with yews from Naranganset to Cape May and left as a monument to my passing. The street? No, the city itself? Henceforth, let it be known as the Steve M. Cowett Memorial Park and Museum. <laughs> Better yet, if the thing can be done without too much fuss, let the whole planet to sleep. Let the pigeons and buses and lawyers and ladies hanging out wash freeze in their tracks. Let the whole thing be preserved under ice just as it looked when the last bit of drool trickled over my chin. Let the last of the galaxies sizzle out like a match in the wind and the cosmic balloon shrink down to a noodle and screech to a halt. Let time clot like a pinprick of blood and the great solar flame flicker down to the size of a Yertzit candle, leaving the universe dark but for one tiny spotlight trained on the figure of me propped in my chair. For after my death, what possible reason could life in any form care to exist? Don't you see it would be utterly pointless? I would be gone. Look, try to conceive it, a world without me, me entirely absent. Nobody here with these eyes, this name, these teeth. Nothing but vacant space, a dry sucking wind where I walked, where I sat. Where you used to see me, you would see nothing at all. I tell you, it dwarfs the imagination. Oh yes, one last thing. The right leg is to be crossed over the left. I prefer it that way and poised on the knee. Prop the left elbow up on the arm of the chair with a pen in my right hand. Let my left be characteristically scratching my skull or pulling my hair. 
if you wish, close the lids of my eyes. But whatever you do, the mouth must remain open, just as it was in life. Yes, open forever. On that, I absolutely insist. Steve poking fun at himself. Yeah. Yes, yes, I love that. Um, he lived it. I try not to take myself too seriously, but what I love about that poem is that I'm reading it as as serious sometimes as we are or as serious as life sometimes is. We are gone, and the stories and the poems will be remembered. His poems and his life is remembered, but there will always be more, and there will be more poets writing and creating along the way. So. Yeah, uh, we miss Steve, and he was, he was a political poet. He was mm -hmm. very deeply affected by the, everything that was happening in the world, mm -hmm. and he spoke to power, mm -hmm. truth to power, mm -hmm. uh, and yet he still found a way yeah. to make us laugh. Yeah. And I think that was part of the appeal and the reason why a lot of us, we really miss him. And yeah. we're keeping his, uh, his book alive, his work alive, uh, by celebrating him through the Cowart Prize. And uh, you're here tonight. You've come down to California to, or San yeah. Diego. To, uh, uh, you're going to be our keynote speaker. Yes. And you're going to present a few of your own poems as well. Uh, yeah. Would you like to give us an advance and read a couple poems now? Sure, sure. I'd be honored to. Um, so I'll read a poem that I wrote that was inspired by thinking about things I'd seen in California, things I'd, I've hoped for, and things I'd imagined. And so this is titled, My California. Here, an olive votive keeps the sunset lit. The Korean 20-somethings talk about hyphens, graduate school, and good pot. A group of four at a window table in Carpinteria discuss the quality of wines in Napa Valley versus Lodi. Here, in my California, the streets remember the Chicano poet whose songs still bank off Fresno's beer-soaked gutters and almond trees in partial blossom. Here, in my California, we fish out long noodles from the pho with such accuracy you'd know we'd done this before. In Fresno, the bullets tire of themselves and begin to pray five times a day. In Fresno, we hope for less of the police state and more of a state of grace. In my California, you can watch the sun go down like in your California. On the ledge of the pregnant 22nd century, the one with a bounty of peaches and grapes, red onions and the good salsa, wine and japche. Here, in my California, paperbacks are free. Farmers markets are 24 hours a day and always packed. The trees and water have no nails in them. The priests eat well, the homeless eat well. Here, in my California, everywhere is Chinatown, everywhere is K-Town, everywhere is Armenia Town, everywhere a little Italy, less confederacy, no internment in the valley, better history texts for the juniors, in my California, free sounds and free touch. Free questions, free answers. Free songs from parents and poets, those hopeful bodies of light. Mm. Did you write this poem before you became Poet Laureate of California? I did. I wonder yes. if that helped you get the post. I don't yeah. know. Um, I wrote that in about 2000. In eight, 2009, yeah. um, I wrote it at a time, it was the presidential election, and people were talking about what they wanted to see in California. Mm -hmm. Laws were changing, marijuana laws, same-sex marriage laws, 
and I was inspired and just thought, this is my state too. Yeah. And I, I don't know if it helped me get the post or not. I, I, I mean, I think that a poet laureate's work is going to be rooted somewhat in the place. Absolutely. But most of my poems aren't. I have some California poems. But um, it's interesting. A lot of times a person will say, well, you represent this place. And I, I can see what they mean. I feel like I'm more representative of one part of California. You know, I'm, I'm wary of trying to represent people, but I'm, but I'm honored and, and happy to be from here. Now, you have to do a project as well, right? Part of the job is to do a project that's almost like a statewide community type project. Mm -hmm. uh, is that in the works now? Yes, yes. So hopefully within the next month or two, I'll be launching the program. It's called Our California. And it's a statewide invitation to any person, poet, someone who wants to try to write a poem, and certainly active poets who are publishing. It could be a person of any age, any background, documented or not, um, free or not. You know, I just did a talk at a state prison, and those are Californians too. Mm -hmm. And so we'll get hard copy submissions from some of those folks. But any person who wanted to write a poem about their town or their city or their California as they see it. And it could also just be a poem about an experience or a memory that's rooted in place. Mm -hmm. And those will all be posted on the California Arts Council website. And I'm very excited about that. We've already got a lot of educators and poets and librarians asking when that'll be up and running. So hopefully that'll be up in the next month or two. And we would love to have people send in those, those poems to the California Arts Council. Do you already have a submissions uh, guideline for dates, like when it starts and when it stops? I'm, I'm still shaping that. I know that we'll launch the submissions, call for submissions once it's up and running. And I, mm -hmm. I hope that can be sometime mm, early summer, yeah. hopefully around June. and. Those will probably remain open for the duration of my term. Mm -hmm. and, two um, years, right? It's a two-year two -year term. term. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not for life. Not for <laughs> life. <laughs> uh, the publishing has changed quite a bit. So the computer, the screen, social media. Mm -hmm. uh, nowadays, a lot of people self-publish, right? Mm -hmm. and just go for it. Before, you needed like a publishing house. Uh, what do you see in terms of the future of writing and publishing and becoming a poet of renown or a poet who's got mm. exposure to enough folks to live on the craft mm. and your, you know, your passion? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think living on poetry is tough. Um, Teach. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a professor and, you know, some, some poets could probably make a living at it. But um, as far as the future of publishing goes, I was just talking to a friend of mine who's active in, in publishing and literary magazines and editing in Los Angeles, and I asked him if digital and virtual and audio and those formats are blossoming even more, and he said something that I agree with, and that was that there's a return to the page in really meaningful ways. It might look different. Uh, I think publishing... Is, is expanding in terms of aesthetics and um, the writers they're publishing. But I'm happy to see literary magazines in print still doing well. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to see readings and events in public libraries. These are the things that sustain us. And whereas some new trend might be interesting and very valid, I, I love some of the QR code poetry I'm seeing and things like that. But ultimately, there's no mistaking good, meaningful poetry in whatever format it takes. It could be published with a big publishing house or self-published by a local press. Great art is going to find its way. Indeed. I love to hold a book 
yeah. when the anthology publishes, I walk around the house with it like yeah. a baby. When it Absolutely. first comes, I love the way it feels in my hands, the way Absolutely. it smells, everything about it. Mm -hmm. The way it cracks when I open it, when that first moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, books, man. I'm a bibliophile Absolutely. for sure. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about AI? You know, you can, we could say Lee Herrick, Michael Clam, Rare Books Room, and it'll create a poem, it'll create yeah. a, an image for us. What yeah. are your thoughts on you know, I think intelligence. With, with AI and, and that being more in, in the news now, I, I'm reminded of the, the lamentations of scholars and writers when the typewriter was invented and Camera. when the uh, word processor mm -hmm. allowed us to save work on a disk and things like that um, and texting. You know, with AI, yes, it could produce a poem, but no machine that I know of um, can tap into the kind of sorrow or the kind of rage mm -hmm. or the kind of sadness or the kind of joy that a human can, that produces the great art. So it can be as well crafted in pantameter or nuance maybe as a, a person could in a classroom, mm -hmm. but can't even come close to approximating the emotions of the human condition. So. Um, I, I don't foresee it, it replacing books yeah. and poetry anytime soon. Yeah, and because of that, it's an irrational fear to worry that AI will take mm, over. I mean, I understand the fears. Yeah. I understand the concerns. I've got colleagues who are seeing it encroaching upon uh, academic discourse already, um, authenticity and plagiarism and things like that. So I understand and respect fears. Yeah. But um, use it as a tool, no? As yeah. part of your process. Try yeah. it out. Yeah, I, th I think everything has its place and everything can also be misused. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, art's going to win out. I'm biased when I say that, but yeah. I think art will win out in the mm -hmm. long run. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you coming down. The Cal Prize ceremony will be even bigger and better because you're here. So as part of your time here, we get to celebrate Steve even more as a mentor, as a poet, as someone who inspired all of us. Uh, you're doing great work in the post. Uh, congratulations. Thank and uh, would you take us out with a poem? I'd be happy to. And thank you for having me, Michael. And I'm honored to be here. This is a poem titled A.B. Sedarian Love Song for Street Food, and it has an epigraph from the late Anthony Bourdain who said, street food, I believe, is the salvation of the human race. All praise for the pozole glistening in midday light by the grace of the woman near the comal. In Southern California, Raul Martinez unveiled a mobile downtown gold mine of Al Pastor by a bar in East LA for the drunks, the artists, the necessary future waiting in line. Praise be to the ice cream truck, glory of the van's slow roll, so praise the van, hut, cart, booth, tent, stall, stand, bike, or truck. I once devoured a Tlaiuda in Oaxaca City, broke down just as the sunlight burst through the heart of a woman kissing her baby's forehead by the plaza. When I say love, what I mean to say is I dream of you through disaster, malady, drought, or that nightmare anxiety pandemic. But now, even in this late dying, let us praise the 20,000 open-hearted vendors in Bangkok and the glorious pupusas in San Salvador I ate on a bench near a dove. Quesadilla, arepa, tupoki, hallelujah. <laughs> The bon mi right on the outskirts of Hue. The chili pepper, the cilantro songs, praise the Zocalo saints who brought me to tears with a taco so full of music I almost wept. Under the Beijing moonlight, Bautza is made by angels. 
vendors with wings if you know where to look. On West 53rd and 6th Avenue, New York City, Halal, or in Fresno, no xenophobe is welcome. Tell me what to eat. Your chuan, your elote, your mouth full of pure zen, like savory, surprising flashes of heaven. Praise be the ice cream truck and 24-hour <laughs> farmer's markets, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, and praise be all the folks who feel the same way that uh, we do about poetry, the cities that have laureates now. We're in our second year, yeah. and Jason Magawa Perez is coming in strong, and he's got some great plans. Uh, yeah. We're looking forward to uh, the website and seeing how your project goes, your view of California, right? Yeah. What's it going to be called? What's It'll that? be called Our California. Our California. People can go to the website and see what's happening there for updates and that kind yep. of thing. Okay. It'll be Our California on the California Arts Council website uh -huh. and would love to have many poets from San Diego send something in. and. You will um, now. It's going to be stacked tonight. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm excited. I mean, honored, deeply honored to celebrate Cowett's life and all the poets and prize winners tonight. Yeah, yeah. and uh, special thanks to, to the Central Library for giving us the space to do conversations with poets. Snapcast does a phenomenal job, so thanks guys. And uh, thank you once again. Enjoy your stay in San Diego. Thank you. Mm -hmm.